Okay, calling us on. Good morning. Welcome everybody to 314, a course of media and technology and ministry. Let's pray and get started. Could somebody please pray with us and we'll get started. Anybody? Siddhant, why don't you pray? Please. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for everything, Lord. Thank you for this time and for this class. Lord, help us to understand and receive the things which you have kept us. Lord, let your spirit of wisdom work in us. I thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Ah, thank you. All right, so we, in the last couple of lectures, we talked a little bit about print media. We talked about radio, television, and films. Just looking at, you know, all of these different ways and forms of communication, mass communication, and uh, how we could, um, reach people or influence people, their thinking, through leveraging uh, these channels of uh, mass communication. Uh, just in passing, I want to mention uh, entertainment and gaming. I was going to mention that, just to keep that in front of our minds. and. Um, and then we will move into what I want to really look into going forward is uh, the place that the internet has in the things we do for ministry. So when you're talking about entertainment, I don't know what you know what, what your thoughts are. And I'll try to put all this few few points in the notes and give this give the PDFs out. But uh the fact is, you know, as people, as, as yes, we are Christians, we are believers, but we also like to have some forms of recreation. This is just do some fun things. And, uh, you know, uh, all of us will have different forms of recreation. Maybe you like to go out for a meal, maybe you like to, I don't know, watch good a good movie or just whatever, we, different people have different forms of recreation. And uh, uh, entertainment then has its place there to provide a form or a means of recreation. So this is my personal opinion. I don't know how you would look at it. So I don't think it's wrong for believers, Christians, to have entertainment as one of their forms of relaxing and recreation. What do you think? Is it okay? It's not okay. It's, it's okay, sir. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Pastor, it's okay. Depending on the the context you 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 choose to um you choose to relax in uh, as a christian you cannot entertain yourself with secular with secular music or with anything that is worldly there can be christian entertainment where the thing that is involved is is not secular so mm -hmm. it is okay but the context should be you should be mindful of the context thank you that's right good good thank you anyone else Yes, no. Yeah. S say, go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I, I believe, I believe um, there's nothing wrong um, we entertaining ourselves. Um, the Bible says that the, there is peace, joy, um, righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Mm. And... Um, 
if our entertainment is a product of the joy of the Lord and not just basically to gratify the flesh, I see nothing absolutely wrong with mm. that. Um, as long as the intention is primarily and foundationally to point many to Jesus, mm. to point people to the person of Christ, his character and his ways, to show people the kingdom, you know, if that is the basis and our intent and goal at the end of the day, at the end of every type of entertainment, whether it's even you just coming out to talk on a joke mm. or just, you know, um, a playlet, you know, or any form of entertainment, as long as that goal and purpose is there, uh, there's nothing wrong. We mm. entertain ourselves. But the moment mm. it's gratifying the flesh, the moment it's pointing others to ourselves, to exalt ourselves, or it's trying to even deviate people, you know, from the path of righteousness, then there is something wrong with that type of entertainment. That does not spring from the Lord. So mm -hmm. everything should be intentionally pointing to Jesus from the basis of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that gives us joy. Thank you. Correct. Good, good. Thank you. Right. So, yeah, so I think, you know, we could agree that uh, as long as the entertainment is godly, it's clean, it's righteous, pointing to the Lord, God glorifying, there's nothing wrong, you know. And as believers, we do need to relax. We need to do some fun things and uh, glorifying God, right? So there's, so, so what I wanted to get to is there is this whole space of entertainment which we as people, uh, meaning God's people, can, of course, we engage in it for ourselves. Meaning, okay, we 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 are we find it as a we enjoy it as a as a form of recreation, but it can also be become a means for us to connect with people from outside. Hey, you know, can invite people, come and see, you know, come and enjoy uh, something that's clean something that's godly, something that's pure, and uh, it can become a, a, a touch point for people. From there, they can, you know, experience Jesus Christ. So there are many different expressions of this, you know, like uh, I think some of you touched on it, like we could, where you could, uh, you could uh, have, you know, a comedy show, <laughs> a clean comedy show, making, you know, jokes, but it's clean. It's nothing vulgar, nothing indecent. You can have comedy as a form of entertainment, uh, and so on. Uh, I just want to point us to one or two things. I'm not spending too much time on this, but there is this whole idea now, especially in the United States, and uh, there is some replica of it happening in uh, in India. Uh, there may be things in other parts of the world. I'm not very sure, but you know, these this idea of theme parks um, where um, you know, you can come and, uh, uh, you know, just have a very relaxing time, but it's also a very engaging, meaningful time, you know. So can you all see my screen? Uh, uh, I'm just sharing my whole screen here. Can you see this? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I'm just pointing us to one or two things, right? So in the United States, so there's this one called the Ark Encounter. And you can go to their website if you want to know, and you can watch their videos and all of that. But uh, again, you know, some Christian ministry uh, has, uh, uh, they have created a replica, a, a, a actual size replica of Noah's Ark. And it's like an, uh, an experience that you go in, and it's almost like taking you back to how would all of this have happened? How would all of this have unfolded? You know, and you can, they have some videos and all that you can watch here. Uh, where is it? Yeah, about the arc. Uh, you can watch these videos and, uh, and see. So, uh, uh, so it's a fun thing, you know, uh, but in the process, they're reaffirming 
biblical truth to us you know so uh, you know you could probably spend a day or two uh, just going around the place and seeing uh, and 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 you know looking at it and learning uh, you know well this is how it would have actually happened and give you a tour of the ark and you know how it most likely would have been built and so on so this is one kind of uh, interesting thing that people are doing uh, similarly there is uh, uh, a museum called creation museum where uh, they they again reaffirm the fact that yeah you know you find all these things but all these things are pointing us to uh, create a God you know and they reaffirm uh, the truths of the Bible and uh, uh, and so on so uh, here's another you know um, museum uh, where the things of the the Bible are affirmed in in this in this theme park so just pointing us that you know uh, something like things like this you know where uh, these are very very uh, engaging and yet uh, there is meaning uh, and you know you, you can Go with the families, spend a day out uh, as a part of recreation, and so on. And but yet, you know, uh, there's this beautiful things happening. So I'm just pointing us to like the, the believers were engaging in various ways, uh, and uh, uh, because people do spend time to relax, and people do spend time in entertainment, that is a space that the church can tap into very meaningfully uh, and provide something. For the church and even for the world to come and see and experience and in the process hopefully they will encounter God or at least be made to ask the right questions to uh, uh, learn about the true and living God right so just mentioning that in passing um, I see a question here uh, from Christopher can believers listen to secular music where the content is not ungodly um, yeah, uh, I mean, I'm just giving you my opinion, and, and you know, we could discuss this. You know, as long as the content is not ungodly, it's not provoking us to do wrong things, evil things. But you know, it's an example. You know, there's a lot of classical music um, that is not necessarily from a Christian producer, or Christian musician, or composer, but the music itself is rich, and you know, I, I don't see anything wrong in it. I, I personally don't spend a lot. Of a lot of time do, listening, but I don't see, uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. It's almost like education, right? Uh, we all, you know, we go to school. Well, our teachers are not Christians. Uh, if you go to a general school, I mean, yeah, if some people go to Christian school, that's different. But when you go to a general school, you go to school and college. The teachers are teaching us whatever subjects. They're not believers. Um, we spend so much of our lifetime in schools and colleges getting education, being taught by um, people who are not believers. We don't disregard that. You know, that's part of our life journey. So, you know, in a similar way, and of course, we filter things out in the sense that if there's anything that's contradicting to God, or then you know, we, we we challenge that. But so, in a similar way. When it comes to music, you're not disregarding everything just because it doesn't have Christian content in it. We are careful if it's ungodly, explicitly ungodly, pushing us away from God or into unrighteousness, we avoid that. But if it's otherwise clean, uh, there's nothing wrong in that. Okay. So the next thing um, that I just want to quickly mention is about gaming. Uh, which again uh, in the recent decades has become uh, something that has caught the attention especially of the younger generation and nowadays people have games on their phones and and so on um, what I want us to think about is that gaming of course there are the wrong, there is the wrong side of it which 
where you know there are games that are violent or explicitly evil. Of course, we need to avoid that. But gaming itself can be used and is being used, I should say, is being used for education. So that means this whole, uh, the word gaming sometimes can be very misleading, but actually it is basically a very engaging interaction with media, whether it's on a computer or on your phone. And if it is being used for education, it's media being used for developing certain skills. So you can find that gaming is used to train medical professionals. You know, so um, the whole gaming software has been so designed that surgeons are walked, or you know, surgeons or different medical practitioners, or different pract uh, spe specialties. Um, the physician is walked through, you know, scenarios that are, almost look real life, and then they have their they can diagnose, they can perform surgeries, they can do various things. But really, it's a gaming engagement. And it is developing their them in that particular field. Similarly, gaming and simulation can be used to train pilots or astronauts or, you know, for different, different, you know, industries. So what I just want to, again, uh, put before us is that this whole gaming space can be leveraged for very good causes, very good purposes, either to, you know, it could be a simple Bible quiz just to engage your mind uh, about the Bible, or it could be a game that creates real life scenarios where you are forced to apply the Bible while you're engaging uh, with that digital content, right? And, and it's engaging because it involves your mind, your, your sound, your visual, uh, and then your thought process, your cognitive abilities uh, to think through it. Like you need to know the Bible and you need to know, apply it to a real life, uh, a situation that's presented to you um, as you engage with that uh, media. So. I think this is a space where God's people, I'm saying believers, we can do a lot more to create, to create some really challenging, meaningful content. Now, there are already, you know, there are already people who have created, you know, um, various Christian-based games, like, you know, uh, playing games to check your knowledge of the Bible and quizzes and all that. It's very interesting just to play in. Uh, answer those questions, uh, but you know we can extend this into a lot more, um, in, in a lot more creative ways, all with the object of building people up, right? So it's we're using it in a very positive way uh, to build people up in in the Word of God and how to apply the Word of God. So just just mentioning these two things: entertainment and gaming. Because these are also things where people are engaging, people are being involved, uh, whether it's from a believer's perspective or from people in the world who don't know God, don't know the Lord, they're all involved. And if we, as the church, can do nice things, very creative things, and, and, and produce them, it'll definitely get the attention both of the church and also of people outside the church and minister to them, serve them, and be a blessing to them. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about entertainment and uh, gaming. Uh, I'll put a few notes uh, together and share that on uh, with you. Um, any questions before we change topic? All right, Asha has a question. If an unbeliever friend invites us to their home, and have a movie time. If they put their choice, like uh, which we never grew up watching, that is not appropriate. How can we erase it out of our mind? Pastor, like our eyes are like a window to our soul, especially when you're trying to reach them out, reach out to them. Please help. Please 
uh, how, I guess you're saying how to understand this. Okay, so now, so I think, yeah. So suppose you go to, go to a friend's house and they they're about to play some something, you know, watch them. They say watch a movie. Now, of course, they're a friend, maybe you know, in school or college or workplace, whatever, neighbor or something, and they're not believers. And they say, come home, and suddenly they say, hey, we, we want to. Can you all want to watch movie? Now, of course, you do have one thing you can do is to kind of present your choice. You know, obviously, people are going to ask what 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 kind of movie you like, or would you like to watch this? Uh, and then, if it's something that's violent or uh, you know. Uh, something that's indecent uh, you could always say hey can we watch something else uh, or I, you know, I'm not so comfortable with this kind of movies uh, I, I that doesn't suit my preference or something so basically in a nice way we are guiding the choice of what what movie is to something that's clean neutral uh, and uh, that you can watch so that's one thing that can we can do the second thing is in case they it so happens that they're already watching a you know a movie that's not decent i mean either you could excuse yourself and uh, or if those images like you like you're mentioning here if those images have gone into your mind then you willfully clean it out you say in the name of jesus i reject all of those ne evil things ungodly things that gain entrance into my mind while i was in that place i reject it i give it no room to stay and you don't recall, don't bring it back to your mind. Even if those images come back, you say, no, I reject it. And soon it will go away because uh, if we don't re recall, we don't you know, bring it back to our memory, it's going to slowly be taken off from the memory. And then we clean ourselves, we clean our minds, of course, with the word of God. Uh, God's word is what cleanses our minds. We you know, read the word and being in the word and refusing to recall those things, our mind will be cleaned out from those images that may have, uh, you know, gained access in. Is that okay? Anything else that anybody wants to discuss now about entertainment, gaming? We just mentioned them in passing. All right. So now I want to kind of move into some little bit more serious, practical, content and uh, I want to start talking about um, you know basically we're gonna now move, move into this whole thing about you know how do we leverage the internet to for the things that we are doing right so chapter 11 this chapter so I need to give you some notes on the previous chapters that I've just spoken to you about on print media and uh, radio television films then entertainment and um, Gaming. I'll put some thoughts down down on that. Now, we want to get into some serious stuff because these are things that uh, all of us would be using on a day to day basis, right? and we are beginning to or we leverage the internet and do these things. So, I want to talk about uh, digital communications and engagement, and then we kind of get into additional topics. Uh, all be all all centered around uh, how the internet begins to play its role or plays its role in how we do media, how we do ministry today. So, for all of us in Christian ministry, you know whether you are going to be setting up a church or some of other form of ministry we will have to engage with people digitally right in times past you know we would write letters or we would send people printed mail that was a big thing maybe 20 years ago or and before when you know you'll post letters to people and things like that send magazines newsletters so on but these days, that that form of communication is almost obsolete, and uh, we a lot of communication is, you know, happening digitally, to various 
channel. So we call it omni-channel communication. The, there's multiple channels that we have to engage. It's almost become, you know, uh, I would say, a requirement for ministries to engage with their people, whomever you're serving, through multiple channels. We can't say, this is the only way I will engage with you. Uh, that usually becomes very difficult. So you have to engage with people in so many channels digitally. Right? And so I just want to cover some of the major main ways that we engage with people and just share some guidance on it, some information on it. For many of you, uh, maybe this is common knowledge and you're already doing it. For some of us, maybe it's things that we can take into the future. When you set up your ministry or you start pastoring or you start your ministry, you can think about these things. So we we're talking about websites and emails, messaging, virtual meetings, digital content platforms, um, having an app, doing podcasts, and those kinds of things, right? And I just want to share some lessons, some you know things we learned, what we should do or should not do. We made mistakes and you know, we learned through the process of all of that. So to begin with, you know, we need to have strategy, meaning some sort of a thought out plan. How are we going to engage with people inside the church and outside the church? Because uh, the way we engage with people inside the church and the way we engage with people outside the church is going to be obviously different. The content we create, for instance, uh, is going to be different, right? You, you, we don't necessarily put out the same content for both inside and outside. Now, sometimes it can benefit both both groups but most often how you the content is going to differ because those outside may not understand uh, uh, you know all the deep things we say for the people who already are familiar with the scriptures and so on for people outside we may need some small steps you know like uh, maybe they may want to join us in an email list uh, in a particular area of interest. Uh, they may want to ask for prayer. They want. They may want to see. You now, what is this church all about? And they may want to look check us out on social media, or you can give them a helpful resource. You know, like uh, uh, on parenting or marriage or uh, you know overcoming certain things or whatever. So, so things that are of interest to them. So you will deal with them on that. Whereas on those inside the church, the digital communications, the digital content is usually on discipleship. And how to, how to make them stronger in their faith, uh, how to get them equipped for ministry, uh, and then to be part of certain activities in the church, you know, whether it's a small group, whether it's getting serving in church, whether it's, you know, they may want to get baptized, things like that. So the needs that we are trying to address and the way we address people inside and outside the church vary are different right so at a very basic level when you know we need a, for a church or for your ministry you need to think about how you're going to do this and so here are some basic questions right that we can ask okay so who are the people that we are trying to reach so people inside the church who are the people inside the church you know um, for example if i talk about um, uh, apc in bangalore then I would say, hey, 60% of the people inside the church coming to our church are youth, or you know, they are 60% you know, are below 35. So they that's a big chunk of people, you know. And then you've got uh, the remaining 40% that make up 35 plus. So uh, you know, the majority of the church are young people in the church then i would say these people are you know mobile are upwardly professionally mobile that means um and i'm just describing our congregation okay i'm not saying this is true for everybody i'm just saying you need to understand the people you're ministering to and so i'm just giving a, giving this as an example so i would say the other thing i would say the people they are ministered to inside the church are uh, professionally mobile that means uh they are going to be in in our city in the church for maybe an average period of five years 
and uh, five to seven years. And it's very likely at the end of that period, they're going to relocate and they're going to move to some other part of the world. Uh, that's just a trend within our congregation. They're an upwardly mobile congregation. Uh, it's the other segment, that means the, the, those who are uh, um, you know, 40, on the other side of 40, who m most likely may stay on in the city. Again, we are not sure. They also could move, but that would be the general trend, right? But everyone below 40 is highly likely in a, within the next five to seven years, they're going to be moving. And they'll be, and I would say, the third characteristic of the congregation is that always there are steady inflow of new people, steady inflow of new people. So there are people moving constantly, moving out, and there's also people moving in, because a lot of people are coming into the city mainly for two reasons: education and profession. So people are coming into the city constantly. Then they find us; they come to church. So there are new people coming in. People usually, generally, after a period of five to seven years they're ready to move out they get married or they the job changes they move out. now outside the church okay here whom should we meet whom should we target because the composition of the inside of the church is a certain demographic our immediate response would be hey we want to target a similar demography outside the church because that they were the ones who make an easy connect with the congregation inside. So therefore, who are these people? They are people who are in our city, who are you know, either in schools, colleges, working professionally. Uh, um, they are you know, in these areas of, uh, in, in these marketplace segments. And so we begin to target them. You know, and where, you know, of course, we need to know where do they spend their time in the digital world so that we can reach them there. So like that, we can think through on some basic questions. What are their needs? So think about your congregation. What are their needs? The needs of these people, and you understand it. So then the content that we develop should address those needs. Right? So of course, in the teaching and the preaching, you should be bringing God's word, explaining God's word to them in the things that matter to them. Another question we can ask, you know, where and how are they going to interact digitally with the church and ministry? What are their likely touch points with the church in the digital world? You know, so you should understand that, hey, the majority of our congregation, they like to interact like this. People outside the church whom we are trying to reach, they would interact like this. Right? Now, again, people outside the church could be believers outside the church, meaning when you, because this is a digital space, you're not constrained in any way geographically. So when you say outside the church, you can look at the church outside the church, or you can look at the world outside the church. Look at both segments, right? Because the digital content that you develop could serve both these spaces. So it's okay, we are developing digital content and this content could be useful to the church outside our church, our congregation. So that is a global reach. Um, um, some of the content you develop could serve the world outside your congregation. That is those who don't know Christ yet. Right? So, that, so think of both. Then think of what channels would you use to serve them? Where are these people likely to consume the content you develop? What would be the best places, right? So then that would determine how you distribute your content to them. What are the objectives? What are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to equip them? Are you trying to bring them to faith in Christ? Are you trying to um, uh, get them to engage with the activities of the church? Are you trying to get them to come to certain outreach events? So there are different objectives that you can think of, right? And so then, for those objectives, there has to be specific content that's developed. And then, of course, we also need to think about what's going on, evaluate the progress, modify, keep changing, uh, and then 
go through the whole evaluation process again, right? So this thought process must be, it's an ongoing thing, right? Something we decided, say, three years ago may no longer be relevant today because things have changed so fast. So we need to rethink. Uh, and sometimes we may need to change. Uh, we need to modify this whole, our, whole, our digital engagement strategy. Yeah, we need to rethink, redo. And there's nothing wrong with that because things are changing around us. Okay, So this is just a simple uh, table for thinking through on a digital engagement strategy for your church or for your ministry. Like, ask these basic questions, nothing complicated, uh, in relation to the people that you're going to serve. Okay, let me pause here. Let me just see if, uh, if we are all together. Now, everybody's with me. Uh, I know I've kind of shifted direction. Yeah, uh, everybody's with me so far. Okay. Any questions so far on this? Just introducing the topic. Okay. Let's uh, move forward. Now, it's important in, 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 in what we are doing digitally to evaluate progress. And that means, like, how, have, how do we know that we are actually being effective. So example, you produce some video content or you produce content on your website, uh, so many things you can do. You can maybe sometimes you write, some people may write blogs, uh, some people may create a podcast, uh, some people may, uh, you know, uh, uh, produce digital books or so many things. Uh, how do we know it's actually being useful to people or it's making a difference in people's lives or that we are achieving our objectives, right? So we need to evaluate progress. Now, the thing is, we need to differentiate, uh, when we talk about you know measuring, evaluate, we need a difference between what we would refer to as vanity metrics and uh, uh, what are the, the real things we need to ask, be looking at, right? So sometimes, um, these metrics, meaning number of views, number of likes, number of sh shares, maybe shares, okay, are useful, but uh, views, uh, likes, they sometimes could be very misleading, right? Um, they may not be actually reflecting the accomplishing of our objectives. So, for example, we, we know, right, when you put out a video uh, or, let's say, uh, or, or, or on, uh, you know, whatever length of video is, a view often is just if they watch a few seconds. This depending on what, uh, what kind of content you have. If, you, if you're putting out an ad, if they watch the first five seconds, it's counted as a view, right? So, okay, let's say you run an ad. And uh, you know you get a you know, uh, you, know you, you run a sixty second ad uh, on YouTube, and uh, you know YouTube is showing you you've got you know so many thousands of views. It doesn't mean that many people actually watched your video for entire sixty seconds. All it means is it's giving you some. You know, actually, we don't know exactly. But it could get so many, they watch at least five seconds of that 60 seconds. That's counted as a view. Now, they watch five seconds, it's counted as a view. So they, they've missed major part of what you'd put out. Right? Uh, we don't know uh, how many seconds. Of course, you can look at the metrics and say, you know, what percentage, how much they watched. You can get some averages but it doesn't reflect in the actual view that you see the view count. So those kind of things, you know, um, are not a, not a correct picture. So for example, how many people are, how many subscribers we have 
yeah, on your channel. Well, you may have so many subscribers. Does it mean all the subscribers are watching all the content you're putting out? No. It's nice to have a large number of subscribers, but there's no guarantee that they're going to be consuming everything you put out. Right? Um, but then what are the questions, some real questions we need to ask? You know, are we reaching new people? How many people are taking the first step? So how would you know you're reaching new people online? Well, of course, you can look at the number of people who are interacting with the content. But then from there, are they coming to your event? Are they coming to your service? Are they connecting to the church or whatever? Are they going past that view, past that, uh, that first initial connect digitally to something that you can say, yeah, this is a person that we have reached online, right? Are they taking the first step? Um, you can then look at the names, you know, that been added to your list or the database. Uh, are people finding us online? So, okay, you have a website and so on. Uh, how many people are coming to church be because they saw you online, right? So then that, that gives a good reflection of the effectiveness of your website or the ad or the content that you've put out. And um, are you helping people move along their journey, you know, from the first step to the next step? So these are some tough questions to ask because this kind of gives us the real effectiveness of what we're doing as opposed to just like, okay, I got so many views and I got so many subscribers and uh, so many people happen to you know see the website uh, that is good i'm not saying they're bad yeah it gives you some idea but that may not be giving you the true effectiveness of what we are doing the real effectiveness of what we're doing is in are people moving forward in their transformative process in their spiritual journey so while we look at both sets of numbers, we need to understand them correctly. One is giving you some idea of what's happening in the digital world. The other is giving you insight into what's happening in people's lives. And these are two different things. Um, I hope I made myself clear. Is it, are you following me? Okay. Everybody's very quiet, so I don't know <laughs> if I got the point across. You, you're following me. Okay. All right. Fine. Any questions? Okay. So just an example, you know, uh, we'll, we'll talk a few examples and then we'll, we'll close. So, so understand, you know, these the metrics that YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram gives is telling us, okay, in the digital world, this is what's happening. But what we need to probe and find out is what's happening in the lives of people. And that's a true effectiveness of what we're doing. Okay, how would we do that? You know, I mean, you could just think of something here. Suppose you had, uh, okay, now, you know, in the past, we used to give out um, physical cards for people to fill out. And uh, we still do it for those who come in person. But then there are people watching us online. So what do we do is, hey, go online and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, connect us with connect with us online. So if they do that and they give, give you a comment saying, hey, uh, this message blessed me, uh, or I was watching your sermon and you know this, this has happened in my life. Well, that one person is telling you how they were affected. So that's a count. You can say, hey, so-and-so was truly affected. Right? That's a tangible, real life transformation happening. Or if you are doing, you know, a webinar, 
and um, and so on and so you know and especially this this was true you know during the pandemic when we when people moved a lot of things online and people started connecting online and you were doing on topics that were really very relevant especially during those days um and some of it is still relevant you know in in now that we've come out of the pandemic uh we're talking about these things and uh okay people are connecting so there you can see that these people are participating in something you're offering that's a real number you know if 20 people attended your online business seminar or christian business or a christian professionals thing hey that's 20 people you're affecting that's a real that's a real number right so um a, some churches if you know they redid their website to reach people instead of positioning their website as something for their church they position their website for people who are seeking uh, you know and they want to um, begin their journey of faith so now you can they've re read it redone their website now you can look at okay are people actually using this resource in the journey of faith how many people are actually using the resource okay that's a measure of lives that are being touched and the effectiveness of uh, this repositioning that has happened through the website okay that's a real measure or if you're doing a podcast on marriage how many people are being you know uh, responding to that podcast and they're connecting with people so are you know new people listening to it and then connecting to the church okay that's a real measure of a life change a life transformation right and uh, if so many couples participated and a third of them were new to the church then you can say hey this online retreat or seminar actually helped us reach new people about 300 new people new couples so you can say yeah this 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 is a real number of lives being changed all right so i'm just giving so there's just some examples where you can think about uh, you know this is a real count of life change therefore effectiveness of our digital engagement this is real you know we are engaging with people digitally various forms the website or seminars or whatever and these are real numbers of people being changed that shows yeah whatever you've done is effective okay so just to close out here uh you know think about you know if you example if you're thinking about teens, young adults, what would be a digital engagement strategy for them? Yeah. So how would you start thinking about it? You would say, okay, let's see what are the main digital platforms where these people are engaging. You can look at look it up online if you want. And then think through those questions we put up on the table earlier. And how are you going to engage with this particular demographic, right? So you can then begin to think about what content are you going to develop for this group of people? How are you going to deliver it to them? And then how are you going to measure the effectiveness? And in measuring, look at life change, not just, you know, how many people's, <laughs> people give a thumbs up or a like, right? Look at actual life change. That's where you can determine the effectiveness of what's happening. I'm going to pause here. There's a lot more we're going to cover in this uh, thing bit by bit. We'll get into it, and I'll share some of our learnings and experiences as we go forward in this. Um, any questions before we leave? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if there are no questions, we'll close. We'll.
continue this digital engagement. Uh, sorry, tomorrow. Yeah, we have it tomorrow. I said next week. Yeah. Let's close in prayer, please. Somebody could close in prayer, and then we'll dismiss. Can I pray first? Please go ahead. Father God, we thank you for teaching us those beautiful things, Father, to reach out the utmost to the maximum people in the ways that can impact their lives. And we are so very thankful to you that you're teaching us bit by bit. And as we are learning, Father, may it be retained in us, may it be used by us to reach out the multitudes, Father, and bring a difference to the society, to the nations, and to the church as well, Father. In all ways, Father, lead us and guide us and bless Pastor and all the students to use it uh, for your glory and for your kingdom expansion. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. God bless. Bye now. Thank you, Thank Pastor. You. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.